Good evening and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channels Television. I'm Millicent Mwoka. Here are some of the highlights. President Mohamed Buhari laments impact of coronavirus and global economies, presents 13.08 trillion Naira budget for 2021 to a joint national assembly. Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 uh, indicates that Nigeria is set uh, to set aside a national testing week to enable more people get tested. And controversy mounts over the next stage of the U.S. presidential debate as President Donald Trump and his opponent Joe Biden disagree over virtual engagement. According to health experts on the coronavirus, testing is key in assessing the COVID-19 situation and coordinating the response to the pandemic. In Nigeria, about 545,364 tests have been carried out so far, with only 59,739 cases confirmed. Data from the NCDC shows that Lagos holds the top spot for testing, by a wide margin, uh, following the samples tested, over 100,000, followed by the FCT. Kano is in third place, Rivers and Plateau in fourth and fifth place, respectively. At the bottom are states like Kogi, which has carried out less than 300 samples, Kebi and Yobe states, with almost 900 samples, respectively. As at today, every state and the federal capital territory has at least one laboratory to test for COVID-19. And according to the NCDC, the tests conducted in those facilities within the NCDC molecular laboratory network are free of charge. The centre reported 155 new cases from eight states last night, with Lagos topping with 84 cases, uh, followed by Rivers 31 and several of the other states. You can see the numbers there. While no death was recorded till date, 51,403 cases have been discharged across the country after 95 persons recovered in five states last night. President Mohamed Buhari presenting the 13.08 trillion Naira 2021 budget to a joint session of the National Assembly. Now, the president announced 157% increase in capital allocation for the healthcare sector to enhance the procurement of vaccines when available, equipping primary healthcare facilities and securing PPEs for frontline workers. According to President Buhari, the Nigerian economy is facing serious economic challenges as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and revenue generation remains a major challenge. The Nigerian economy is currently facing serious challenges with the microeconomic environment being significantly disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. Real growth most product growth declined by 6.1% in the second quarter of 2020. This enabled, this ended the year, the three-year trend of positive but modest real GDP growth recorded since the second quarter of 2017. The 157% increase in capital allocation to the health sector is to enhance the capacity to deliver health care services through the procurement of equipment, vaccines, and other facilities. Two centers of excellence, as well as one accident and emergency center, will be equipped in federal teaching hospital in each geopolitical zone. In addition, numerous primary health care centers will be equipped and upgraded across the six geopolitical zones. Furthermore, funds have been allocated for the expansion of midwives, 
service scheme in the six geopolitical zones. To enhance occupational safety, funds have been provided for the provision of personal protective equipment for health workers. is a clinical and public health pharmacist on the platform of the Association of Hospital and Administrative Pharmacists of Nigeria. She joins us here in Lagos. Thank you for joining us on the program. For having me. All right. Um, you listened to the president um, lament the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and the revenue, but there's also been an increased allocation to boost health care, and this is in light of what COVID-19 has taught us. Um, and this is also in research development um, in the next in next year's budget. Do you think that this is, uh, you know, a timely, this is coming in timely and that this will help in our response to the pandemic? Uh, I, I am so happy at the development uh, because the research must precede development of new drugs or treatments. Uh, so it's something that we should have been doing a lot more of it before now, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's better late than never. So because uh, if you look at the landscape of uh, research, uh, the African region seems to have very little of research going on, particularly clinical trials. And uh, that is, that is uh, something that we need to address. And I'm happy that it's coming up now because when you have clinical trials going on in our region, then we're able to take into cognizance the peculiarities of our people, our population, our environment, all of which come to bear on the spread of disease or treatments that can be achieved with the drugs that are available. So it's a welcome development. The WHO is saying that there is hope that a vaccine might be ready um, before the end of the year. Are you optimistic? Uh, going by what we have uh, in uh, w WHO's uh, uh, response and all of that, I think it's a possibility uh, because you find uh, they have put in place agencies like Gavi, CEPI, and they are looking into manufacture of vaccines. They are supporting the process. They are looking at distribution and they are getting support from a lot of countries and donor agencies like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So it's a possibility. We also understand that nine vaccine candidates, you know, are in the various uh, stages of the trials, especially for the WHO-led COVAX uh, initiative. And, you know, they plan to distribute about two billion doses. Um, but there is question as to equitable um, accessibility or distribution of the vaccine in the first place, because we know countries like the US, China are not amongst uh, that initiative. Uh, I, I expect that there should be considerations already put in place to ensure equitable distribution, and that should uh, uh, take into con cognizance uh, vulnerable population in particular, uh, in terms of uh, giving preference to the kind of that kind of population. So, I believe that uh, with all that, uh, those agencies, like I previously mentioned, are putting into vaccine production, and uh, with all the support they are getting, I believe that they would consider equitable distribution. Now, um, some experts have said that there might be some sort of emergency approval, and this is for high-risk individuals like the healthcare workers on the front lines. What do you think? That they should get it first? I, I think so, because uh, when you are able to ensure safety for the healthcare providers, then you are also able to ensure that there's continuity of care for the population. Okay, so, so it's, it's a welcome development, and it's a, it's a decision taken in the right direction. So uh, it's not uh, reflecting any preference, but it is, it is a right thing to do. And by so doing, we are assuring that the population, the general population, is able to have continuity of care. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Olua Tonyo Joe, clinical and public health pharmacist. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the presidential task force at its briefing today in Abuja had the chairman of the PTF, Mr. Boss Mustafar, indicate that Nigeria is uh, has setting aside a national testing week to enable more people get tested. Mr. Mustafar says the plan is to have everyone in the country test. And that way, uh, it becomes clearer those who are positive from those who are not. In order to ramp up testing, the full implementation of a national testing week will be confirmed shortly, where we will go out and test in each and every local government of the Federation. 
Although Nigeria is no longer in the top five countries by cumulative deaths in Africa, the presidential tafo continues to urge Nigerians to change their attitude of skepticism and nonchalance to the virus. For the avoidance of doubt, the virus is still real, ferocious, and deadly. We still urge, however, that everyone should get tested because testing is the only way to detect, isolate, trace, and treat. Media reports have suggested that many Nigerians do not trust the government and its agencies. We need to continue to build mutual trust between government and the government if successes already recorded are to be sustained in the fight against COVID-19. The Presidential Task Force and relevant agencies are working with the European Union on the issue of flights into Nigeria. As soon as negotiations are completed, Nigerians will be informed accordingly. For flights currently allowed into Nigeria, we are seeing a combined number of 4,500 arriving passengers per day into Lagos and Abuja. Now, schools in the Federal Capital Territory are to resume Sunday, October 11. This is according to the FCT Minister, Mr. Mohamed Bello, at a briefing in Abuja. According to him, the guidelines for the reopening of schools will be released with an academic calendar covering the third term that was abandoned due to the outbreak of COVID-19. It disclosed that the state did not record any case of COVID-19 during the reopening of schools for exit classes. Over in Kaduna, the state's Ministry of Education has approved the reopening of the state's university. A statement by the Public Relations Officer of the Ministry of Education, Mr. Adamu Bargo, says the resumption is to allow students sit for the first semester examination for 2019-2020 academic session, which will commence on Monday, October 19. The Ministry also advises students to check their respective faculties for the examination's timetable ahead of the resumption date. It warns that all staff and students must observe COVID-19 protocols by practicing social distancing, wearing of masks, the washing of hands and the use of hand sanitizers at all times. Now, the UN Habitat has chosen Karu, local government area of Masarawa State, for its COVID-19 response and recovery strategy for sub-Saharan Africa. Karu will benefit from a $200,000 uh, intervention to assist communities embark on a path to sustainable health and urban development. Emergency water resources, hand-washing stations, among others, will be installed in six communities of Karu, local government area, which has the highest number of confirmed cases in the state. UN Habitat has secured a grant, a modest grant from the Swedish Development Agency, SIDA, for the purpose of intervening to curtail the spread of COVID-19 and assisting communities to embark on a path to sustainable health and urban development. What this project seeks to deliver are three key outputs. The first one is installation and commissioning of six emergency water sources. Many people cannot hand washing as serious as the COVID pandemic is. The solution is really quite simple. Wash your hands, socially distance, and um, keep yourself clean at all times. But when they don't have water, how can they do this? So we intend to install at least six water sources, boreholes, hand washing stations, and other health and hygiene interventions in very urban settlements. These are not the usual rural hand pump boreholes. These are solar powered boreholes. And we're hoping that in doing this, we'll also build a community around those boreholes where people will be able to access water and they will own the boreholes. Today, it is Nasarawa State that is benefiting. I'm not looking at it as Kalu benefiting. It is actually Nasarawa State that benefited. Because at the end of the day, you know, when you do this, you are doing it for our state. In the whole of the country, you selected Kalu as a local government for this gesture. We have more on the COVID-19 updates when we return. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. The isolation center at Amatara Umaha South local government area of Abia State has played host to a number of patients who have tested positive to COVID-19. However, now only four patients are left in the center recovering from the disease. According to the health commissioner, Dr. Joe Suji, there are no challenges with testing. He adds that more volunteers have been trained and sent to testing centers across the three senatorial zones to support the response. To have the required manpower, the required training, and the funds to carry out the uh, community, both community sensitization, community testing, and testing uh, uh, sites and centers in the whole of the province. We have four patients, and um, we have we're expecting two who just came today, and we told them to go and get their thing. When they are notified that they are positive, that their results turned out positive, they don't actually know the requirements and they are told to visit the isolation center. So when they come here, we take the history from them, assess them, take their vitals, and then if they qualify to be admitted, we ask them to come in and they go back home to bring their personal belongings and come in here for admission. Let's now delve into the global response to COVID-19. We have joining us uh, from Bloomington, Illinois, in the United States, Mrs. Dion Ibeke, medical doctor. Thank you for joining us on the program. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. Now, I want to begin with last night's 90-minute live debate between Ms. Harris and Mr. Pence, quite heated, largely revolving around COVID-19. Um, I mean, Mr. Pence and the president were being accused of deliberately misleading Americans about how lethal the coronavirus was. I mean, what are people over there? Um, how are they reacting to, to that debate? Well, yeah, it was a very spirited debate. In the United States, we've become very hyper-partisan. So the people who support Trump felt that Pence did a good job and the people who support Biden thought that Kamala did a good job. I don't know if it really moved the needle much. I will say if it resonated with anyone, it was mainly women because they could relate to Senator Harris as she was continuously interrupted her and the moderator, Susan Page, continuously interrupted by um, v Vice President Pence. Um, in terms of misleading the public about coronavirus, we're seeing right now a walking contradiction in the administration. Vice President Pence and, and President Trump are touting this amazing record with how they handled the virus. But the numbers don't lie. We have over 7 million people affected in America with coronavirus and 200,000 people have died. Right now, the White House itself is a hot spot. The president of the United States has been infected with COVID-19. If you can't protect yourself and you can't protect the White House of officials, how do Americans trust you to protect them? Additionally, we have the president, president's own words where he spoke to Bob Woodward in an interview and said that he intentionally downplayed the virus. He knew that this was deadly. He knew that it was worse than the flu. He knew that this was airborne, and he said he always wanted to play it down. And you see him playing it down with how he's politicized simple things like wearing a mask, you know, and his slow implementation of public health measures. So, you know, I think Senator Harris was right on in criticizing their administration for deliberately misleading the American public on COVID-19. As a medical doctor in the U.S., how soon do you think um, it's feasible that there will be a vaccine for COVID-19? And are Americans, I mean, are they looking forward to it? Um, so according to this administration, a vaccine will be out on Election Day, November 3rd. Um, but according to most experts and scientists, they don't foresee a vaccine coming uh, becoming available till the end of the year or maybe even next year. Um, I can tell you in American culture, vaccines have are losing favor. We've already, you know, we're battling people to get a flu shot and other routine vaccines. Now we're seeing um, the politic politicization of vaccines. We're seeing this administration meddle with the FDA 
in terms of production and re and and stopping them from from implementing their safety and efficacy standards. When we're seeing this, when we're seeing him tout that a vaccine is going to be available by election day, we see that this is only being done for political expediency and our safety is being disregarded. So most people will not be excited about getting a vaccine that they don't feel is safe. We don't want a cure that is actually worse than the disease itself. All right, November will be here soon enough. We'd like to thank you uh, a lot. Dr. Dion Ibeke is a medical doctor at Bloomington, Illinois, in the U.S. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Bye. By U.S. President Donald Trump has rejected holding a virtual debate with Democratic rival Joe Biden, as announced by event organizers. A few debate rules changed because of the coronavirus pandemic, resulting in the decision to take the next presidential debate virtually. Now, President Trump has refused to take part in the debate, which will be televised, but would not require both candidates to be in the same room. This is coming as nearly 37 million uh, cases have been confirmed globally with more than 1.05 million deaths. This is coming from the Johns Hopkins University. U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azza was giving the prediction at a Goldman Sachs healthcare virtual conference earlier today. There are around 40 different coronavirus vaccines in clinical trials around the world. Several U.S. companies are developing vaccines that are currently in the crucial phase three stage of clinical trials. The government has chosen three candidates to fund for phase three trials under Operation Warp Speed. It's planned to fast track coronavirus vaccines. In the United Kingdom, the further 17,540 coronavirus cases have been recorded across the country, according to data from the government's COVID-19 dashboard. It means a total of 554,275 lab-confirmed cases have been recorded in the country since the pandemic began. The world's largest annual religious gathering is in full swing and is posing formidable health hazards for Iraqi authorities already struggling with a spike of COVID-19 infections. Tens of thousands of pilgrims, many without face masks and seemingly oblivious of government health guidelines, cram closely together as they queue for security checks while giant cooling fans blow air across the crowd. However, dozens of teenagers with tanks for disinfection on their backs frantically spray visitors, but miss many because they are completely outnumbered. Sweden says it will postpone plans to let more people attend sports events and concerts, citing rising coronavirus infection numbers both within the country and around Europe. The government said in August it intended to raise the limit for some events to 500 from the current 50. However, with the numbers clearly rising in the country, the government says it will have to postpone the move. Finally, a United Arab Emirates company is nearing the end of phase three clinical trials of a Chinese COVID-19 vaccine and hopes to manufacture it next year. The trial, which began in mid-July, is a partnership between Sinopharm's China National Biotech Group and Abu Dhabi-based Artificial Intelligence and Cloud Computing Company Group 42. The vaccine has been administered to more than 31,000 people in the UAE, Egypt, Bahrain and Jordan. And continue to take responsibility to stay safe. You can take a closer look at more updates on the pandemic on our website. That's channelstv.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antonoka. Stay healthy.